Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Emily. Um, I'm glad to be here. So I did my PhD at MIT, and I was using on a big UNAVCO-supported project. But this is my first time at the UNAVCO meeting, so I'm excited to um, meet all the geodesists who have really pushed forward the glaciology science that I did during my PhD and hope to continue in the future. So today, I'll be talking about superglacial lake drainages. A superglacial lake is a lake that forms on top of an ice sheet. You can see one in the picture here. It's this blue lens here. And I'll be talking about a dense GPS array that we set around a single lake in Greenland for multiple years to measure the deformation of the ice sheet when these lakes drain. I was supported or helped by a lot of collaborators, some of which are in the photo. Um, so uh, also at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution where I did my PhD, uh, I was uh, helped with Mark Bain, Jeff McGuire, and Sarah Doss. Ian Yakin and David Sheen were at University of Washington, Tom Herring from MIT, and Matt King from University of Tasmania. And this was a NSF, NASA, and UNAVCO supported project. So I was also asked by Matt to talk a little bit about uh, communicating science and the ways in which I personally communicate science uh, both to other scientists and to the wider public. So the first half of this talk will focus on the science. We'll ask questions like how are, glacial, how are superglacial lake drainages triggered um, and will future lakes that are forming in interior regions of the ice sheet drain in similar mechanisms? So that'll be the first half of the talk. And then we'll move into um, the communicating science portion, where I'll talk about um, my experience with the good, the irksome, and ultimately the essential parts of communicating science. OK, so Surenda started um, us off with a great introduction to the Greenland ice sheet. I'm going to bring us back to Greenland and talk about, um, so Surenda's GPS station was located probably on something that looks like this, a rock outcrop near the terminus of, of the ice sheet. In this presentation, I'll be talking about GPS stations located further inland on the ice sheet around superglacial lakes. Um, and the interest in superglacial lake drainages is basically comes down to the fact that they transport a lot of water from the surface of the ice sheet to the bed of the ice sheet in a few hours, and that can set up um, sliding and different ice mechanics um, in terms of how the ice sheet flows towards the coast and our potential kind of understanding the dynamics of these lakes are important for understanding how much ice is lost from Greenland into the ocean every year. Um, these lakes are certainly spectacular. This is a, an image um, taken by myself flying um, from a helicopter window. It gives you a sense of, of the scale of these lakes. So this lake is probably three kilometers totally in diameter and has a depth maybe 10 to 20 meters. Um, so the volume of this lake, something around mm, maybe a tenth of a cubic kilometer. And so you can see the lake in the center of the image. On the right, this is a lake ice frozen from the previous winter, so this lake did not drain. Um, it actually froze over from the top down, just like a lake would in, in Canada or New Hampshire, and that's remnant lake ice that's floating on top of the, of the lake that's filling during the summer. In the foreground, you can see tons of superglacial streams. So these features right here, which um, just like streams on land flow from areas of high elevation into, into lows, and which is where the lake forms. And then in the background, you can see um, other, other channels. Um, this is a crevasse field. And then the far field, you see the tundra and coast of Greenland. So this lake is about 40 kilometers from, from the ice sheet margin. Um, before my time working on the project, um, people were also interested in superglacial lakes because in the mid-2000s, um, we did not yet know whether or not water could get to the bed of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, there were, um, I guess, questions about whether or not water that you see on the surface just flows uh, on the surface or in glacially and then eventually enters into ocean, but it probably doesn't reach all the way down to the bed. The ice sheet under these lakes is about a kilometer thick. 
the ice is cold, so how can water get from the surface to the bed? But once you start looking um, closer at these lakes, you can see that um, if you visit a lake after it has drained and you hike around the basin or fly uh, over it in a helicopter, you see these um, striking linear features in the landscape, which are um, hydrofracture scarps. So they're the surface trace of a fracture that extends from the surface um, of the ice sheet down to the bed. In the middle, you see one um, just in, in plan view from a helicopter. And then on the right here, you can see the hydrofracture scarp in cross section with a human size figure here and the fracture right here. Based on observations from a single GPS station that was located a kilometer away from the uh, margin of this lake, you could see rapid opening and closing of a hydrofracture crack, as well as order one meter of uplift and then subsequent subsidence within 24 hours of the lake draining. So this evidence paired with uh, field observations of massive cracks, fresh cracks, um, led us to start thinking that water can get to the bed of the ice sheet and it can get there very quickly. Uh, discharge observations or discharge estimates from a lake this size over the two hours it took to drain suggest that discharge into the crack was the same order as water falling over Niagara Falls. So that's a lot of water um, you know, chugging to the bed of the ice sheet in a couple hours. So after we figured out that, hey, these lakes are draining and they're getting a lot of water to the ice sheet um, bed and the ice is then responding um, due to the change of, you know, uh, of friction at the interface of the ice and the bed, we decided to go back and massively instrument this superglacial lake that we know rapidly drains. Um, and the purpose of doing this was to identify a trigger mechanism for rapid lake drainage. What are the mechanisms um, that trigger hydrofractures through basins where lakes form? So to do this, um, we set up 16 GPS stations, all within six kilometers of North Lake. Um, you can see the GPS stations in the, in the triangles here in the cartoon, North Lake's in the center. Um, and the other um, thing to note before we get too much further in the presentation is that superglacial lakes form in regions of uh, surface ice sheet compression. So they form in, in local basins in the ice sheet. And those where those basins are um, is directly related to the bedrock underneath the ice sheet. So the ice in our region is about a kilometer thick. That is very thick, but thin enough to feel undulations in the bed topography. Um, so our North Lake, um, while ice advex through the um, while ice advex through the region, the position of North Lake stays the same every year because that depression where the lake wants to form is tied to the bedrock topography. The other thing to note is that North Lake is just one of thousands of superglacial lakes on the Greenland ice sheet. So while I'll be talking about you know, some very specific measurements around one lake, um, it's important to note that not all lakes drain like North Lake and there's a lot more work to do to um, figure out the idiosyncrasies of, of individual lakes. Okay, so let's get to the GPS array. So uh, the GPS array was 16 stations that were set out from summer 2011 to the end of summer in 2014. During this time, we managed to catch three rapid lake drainage events. The stations are shown in yellow triangles um, on this SAR image here where water is black and ice is a, is a bright reflector. So you can see North Lake in the middle of the image and the GPS stations around it. You can also see streams um, flowing into the lake and then some other lakes in the region. Um, additionally, I have a picture of our, our GPS station set up. So um, when you are deploying uh, GPS instruments on ice in the ablation zone of the Greenland ice sheet, you have to take into account that um, the surface is ablating or melting out about one and a half to two meters over just a couple of months. So you need to set up design that can, um, where your receiver can travel kind of down with the ice that's melting out from underneath your feet. So the setup um, we had was drilling um, 
four meter holes into the ice sheet and then mounting the solar panels and antenna on the top of a long pole. That pole freezes into the ice and then it moves. Um, so the receiver stays in the same location as, as the ice ablates around it. There's one problem with this setup and that is if, um, if you don't go back to your stations and um, kind of maintenance them to, uh, twice a summer, you end up with poles uh, that are melted out and start to um, tilt. So that's, I don't know, maybe a, a curiosity for, for GPS um, geodesists who work on ground that, that moves a little bit but doesn't melt out from under you. Okay, so let's look at the GPS data. So um, in the left, we, we have our, our figure of the GPS array. And on the right, I have a time series from station NL08, which is located about a kilometer and a half below the southern margin of the lake. So it's right here. I'm showing you NL08 because it's the best single station indicator of lake drainage events through the three years of our, of our record. In the time series, we're moving from two days before the lake drainage to the lake drainage at zero, zero days, and then one day past the lake drainage. And GPS displacements are on the Y, and um, the unit is meters. So um, maybe that's also surprising to this community. The GPS displacements we see are order um, you know, half a meter over a couple of hours. Um, that's perhaps huge compared to even the, the large uh, displacements Sorrento was showing us. So if we look at the red line, that's going to show us the uh, vertical component of the GPS station uplift during the lake drainage event. If we, I've, um, kind of, I've zeroed the uh, displacements to the average uh, vertical and horizontal motion in the three days prior to the time slice I'm showing you here. So in the days leading up to the event, we can see that uplift is uh, flatlined. It's not doing anything different than its normal um, flow advecting through the basin. When we get to a half day before the lake drainage, we start to see the uplift um, occurring in the station. Um, so we, we uh, attain about uh, 20 centimeters of, of uplift before the lake drainage occurs, and then a full uh, 60 centimeters of uplift uh, as the water reaches the bed. And I am talking about when I'm marking when the lake drainage occurs based on the um, horizontal, horizontal component of motion oriented in the crack normal direction. So the next line I'll talk about is the black line, which is the crack normal motion. So how does NL08 move both away from and then back to the hydrofracture crack? You can see that in the days before the drainage, um, there's not much going on in the black line crack normal motion. Um, and then right here, we have a sharp excursion of NL08 station south, about eight centimeters, and then that motion is quickly regained um, in about the same amount of time that it, it moves south, it moves back north. So that's the signature of this hydrofracture opening and then closing. Finally, the last line I want to talk about is the flow line motion. So this is the horizontal component that's moving um, down flow line. So for a glaciologist, that just means in the direction that the ice flows out towards the coast. And you can see following the blue line that not much is going on in the, in the days before the lake drainage. It's just moving at its normal advective velocity. You start to see a little bit of speed up in the half day before the lake drains, and then you see a big surge forward of the station when um, the hydrofracture crack opens. So um, this is uh, one station from one year, and the important thing I want to point out is that across the three lake drainages that we are able to observe, we saw uh, precursors in the GPS array, so um, stations moving uh, faster than normal or uplifting before we see that crack normal motion um, in each of the three years. The precursors have a duration of about six to 12 hours, so kind of a half day before the lake goes, and at times they occur in different uh, areas of the GPS array. Okay, so we have 16 stations, so um, the next thing we did after carefully looking at each of the individual stations um, on their own was to try to bring all this information together. We did that using a network inversion filter, which we um, developed uh, the geometry for a specific Greenland hydrofracture case. The inversion filter is a time-dependent inversion of geodetic data, 
that was developed um, here in the solid earth community by Paul Segal and Matthews in 1997. <clears throat> and I believe it's been used extensively in the solid earth community. Um, and what it does is it takes um, a deformation time series for us, that's our GPS measurements. So it takes each individual station's motion during the drainage event. And you pair that with Green's functions for planes in an elastic half space. And these planes are predefined. So for the planes we defined for our Greenland hydrofracture case are a vertical plane that goes from the surface of the ice sheet down to the bed of the ice sheet, about a kilometer down. And we allow that plane to open and close. And then the second and third plane we define are along the base of the ice sheet. So a kilometer down, we define um, a plane that's about the size of our GPS array. And we allow this plane to slip as the ice surges forward when the water gets down there, and to open as a cavity of water inflates underneath the ice sheet, um, as the, essentially the ice sheet is, becomes hydrostatically jacked as, when you get the water down there from the lake drainage event. OK, and then we bring these um, together and invert using a Kalman filter to output the temporal and spatial distribution of slip opening along the planes that would sum to um, equal the GPS displacements that we see at each of our stations. We do a bit of temporal and spatial smoothing with uh, hyperparameters that are estimated by maximum likelihood. And uh, the GPS data set that we're feeding into this filter is, again, our 15 stations. They're processed at 30 second resolution relative to a GNET base station that's located 55 kilometers away. OK. So now I'm going to show you a video of, of the filter. Stop it right there. Um, so just to explain the video before I play it, in the left columns, um, I'm showing you the same GPS data from station NL08 as a couple slides before. So we have the crack normal motion, the open, sorry, the open and closed signature from NL08. Next, we have uplift. So NL08, sta NL08 station uplifting during the lake drainage event. And on the bottom, we have the flow line motion and LO8 speeding up during the lake drainage. On the right panels are um, the, the planes defined in the inversion filter. So on the top, we have the vertical hydrofracture plane, which goes from the surface of the ice sheet down to the bed. It's plotted along strike. So that's uh, essentially, um, it's about five kilometers long, and that's the length of this uh, hydrofracture surface trace right here. And then in the uh, bottom two panels, we have the basal cavity opening, so that inflation of the basal plane, and then extra basal slip, so slip along the base. So I'll play the inversion through in time, um, and the blue diamond follows kind of where we are in the inversion. Um, in the days before the lake drainage goes off, um, not much is going on in the GPS, you can see um, what kind of the noise in the, in the filter um, we might see during these early days. As we approach the drainage event, you'll start to see some things kicking off during the precursor. Specifically, we start to see a little bit of slip and uplift in the basin before the big event, the hydrofracture opening and then closing. And then as the filter continues on up to a day past the lake drainage event, you see basal cavity opening and extra basal slip uh, increasing in both their magnitude and extent across the array. We only, we only um, run the filter up to a day after the event because ice is, uh, we think, deforms elastically up until its maximal time, which for glacial ice is about only a day. So this, um, this methodology is not uh, useful once the ice starts to form viscously, start to deform viscously after one day. <clears throat> These are a couple snapshots from the video I just showed you. The first column on the left is at the end of the precursor. So just to review, we saw basal uplift and slip, um, sorry, basal uplift and extra basal slip um, starting during the precursor, and then that uplift and slip um, expands during the, um, the maximum opening of the drainage event. Uh, in the bottom panels, I've also plotted the horizontal components of uh, the GPS positions in black. 
and then the positions that the inversion filter calculates that the GPS station would move in green. And you can see that they have um, good agreement within um, two sigma error bars for most of our stations. Also, you can see nicely in this panel here, um, the very cool kind of radially out from the lake drainage event pattern of deformation that happens um, when the hydrofracture opens. Um, the next thing we did, um, okay, so we've seen kind of precursor motion in the GPS data. We can also see it in this inversion. Um, the inversion was a helpful tool because it then allowed us to forward model what changes in elastic stress may be occurring across this hydrofracture crack. Essentially, can the precursor um, build up enough stress in the ice to promote crevasses to start forming and to kick off the hydrofracture mechanism? So we used um, how much basal cavity opening and how much basal, uh, extra basal slip has occurred during the precursor to uh, forward model the amount of elastic stress across the hydrofracture plane um, leading up to the time of lake drainage. And that's what I'm showing on the right. So we have um, the hydrofracture plane um, from the start of the precursor to en the end of the precursor. And you can see at the start of the precursor, um, and excuse me, the colors are um, in, in crack normal stress in KPA. A number to think about for ice is 100 KPA. That is um, the amount of stress we think is needed before you start getting um, crevasses opening. Okay. So at the start of the precursor, you don't see any stress, uh, stresses localizing across the hydrofracture crack, but as you move through time, you can see that you start to get tensile stresses um, at the top of the, of the crack and compressive stresses at the bottom. That's essentially mostly due to the fact that you have um, uplift beneath your lake, which creates, which is um, sourced from the GPS displacements essentially doming out a little bit at the surface, which is why you get that uh, tensile stress at the top. And values for this tensile stress in each of the three years are above our kind of 100 kPa magic number for ice. So in 2011, the stresses at the top of the crack are 400 kPa. In 2012, they're about 130. In 2013, they're over 600 kPa. So this is enough stress to start promoting fractures um, in the lake basin. So just to bring it all together, we start with a lake that's in a compressive lake basin. Uh, it has background stresses of maybe negative uh, 100 kPa. We observe this precursor event, which we think is a little bit of water getting down to the bed that starts to slip and uplift um, in, in the basin, which our GPS stations record. And then over this precursor, enough um, stress is localized across the crack to promote crevasses forming. And then if one of these crevasses um, intersects the lake, there's a large enough volume of water in the lake to drive that crevasse down to the bed. So um, importantly, the precursor setting up uh, a kind of tensile transient to promote fractures doesn't, uh, is not the hydrofracture process. It's more of promoting an environment for if fractures could occur. If, one, if a fracture then uh, intersects the lake, the lake can rapidly drain. So we've pretty much answered our, our first question. What, what's, what's a mechanism for why North Lake drain, drains? Um, it's these tensile stress transients that kick up before in the, in the precursor time before lake drainage. So we can use um, our observations at one lake to try to make a prediction of what will happen for other lakes on the Greenland ice sheet. Importantly, um, lakes have been, uh, the region of where lakes occur has been migrating inland over recent decades, and we can see this in, in satellite imagery. Um, but lakes at higher elevation, uh, we do not, we want to want to know or make a prediction of if these lakes will be able to drain in the same way and get their water to the bed, um, because that will change the basal state of the inland part of the Greenland ice sheet. Based on our findings, and also based on some remote sensing work by Kristen Poinar, who wrote a paper in 2015 about this, um, 
we're fairly confident that higher elevation lakes don't drain in similar mechanisms to lower elevation lakes. In fact, a lot of these higher elevation lakes um, drain through overflow runoff through streams, so they fill up their basin and then uh, water exits the lake on a superglacial stream and travels tens of kilometers down elevation until it finds a crevasse field or, or Mulan. And um, this kind of jives with our results because at higher elevations, there are less surface to bed pathways open for water to get to the bed. There are less crevasses um, and there are less moulons. So um, essentially, the meltwater supply to the bed uh, may not be well correlated with the locations of these high elevation lakes. Just because these lakes are forming doesn't necessarily mean that it's kind of a disaster scenario for inland areas of the Greenland ice sheet. OK. So that concludes the, the science section of the talk. So we looked at the question, how are superglacial lake drainages triggered for North Lake? We found in three years, pre-drainage slip and uplift, which place the basin in tension, promoting uh, crevasses. And one of those crevasses can be used to, um, if it intersects the lake, can be used as the hydrofracture, um, as a hydrofracture. And then will surface inland lakes drain via these same self-generated hydrofractures? Um, probably not yet. Importantly, surface-to-bed meltwater pathways, similar to the ones we see at lower elevations, will need to migrate inland in order for um, the same drainage mechanism to occur. Okay. And, okay, so um, now let's move into the kind of communicating science part of the talk. The talk doesn't, or the science doesn't end at paper publication. Um, as I like to think about it, there are many things you can do before, after, and during a paper is published to disseminate your science um, to other scientists as well as um, the greater public. So um, we can move into um, what I hope will be a humorous uh, last couple slides on kind of the good, the annoying, irksome, and essential parts of science communication. So let's start with the good. Um, so something I... Um, have learned about myself and um, perhaps others who communicate science is um, it's important to take the process into your own hands and communicate science in a way that best works for your personality and comfort level. So things I like to do are um, things that allow me to, you know, kind of keep the hold the reins for how my science is disseminated. Um, you know, to what audiences and which ways. And so I like to use things like Twitter, Reddit, um, in-house media offices, a lab website and blogs, and then just physically me talking to um, other people. I'm gonna give an example, oh, sorry. So here's some examples of kind of um, good print experiences I had in media. First was just working with the MIT News Office. Um, they're an in-house media office, so I was able to go to the person writing the story and also check up on, on multiple drafts of the story to make sure everything was right. And there are a lot of things that can go wrong in news because they want to simplify your message to a couple words. So um, this MIT News article, a, a check on drainage, um, I think the title was initially like, not all lake strain, or like, I don't know. It was, it was not, I remember getting the first draft and I was like, whoa, this is not what I want to communicate. But because it was in-house, and, and I knew the person writing the article, I could prevent that from going to print before I saw it. Another good experience I had was working with Chris Mooney at the Washington Post. Um, and I was hesitant to talk to kind of out of in-house media um, when we we're um, releasing this paper because one, I was a young grad student, and two, I didn't know the reporters, but Chris was someone who was recommended to me by other glaciologists as someone who was really, um, has done a lot of research on, on climate science and, and knows the state of the field. So I had a good experience working with Chris, um, and this title, I think, is, yeah, scientists finally have an explanation for why huge lakes atop Greenland are vanishing. I think that's a great title for science communication, right? It, it shows that scientists are working on a problem. It's not um, kind of a doomsday title or a clickbait title. There was one comment I remember from reading this article is um, someone at the bottom was like, well, why did they just figure this out now? Like, why didn't they figure this out 10 years before? And I was like, I don't know, that's a good question. But so, I mean, you get comments back and forth, but this is another, um, Definitely a little out of my comfort zone, but it ended up fine. And then 
there was a Hui in-house um, publication just showcasing graduate student work. Obviously, that was fine. Another thing um, that I like to do is just talk to people online. I like talking to people online because um, a lot of the world is connected to the internet now. So you can reach, well, you don't know who you're reaching, but you can reach pretty much every corner of the globe. So one thing we did with this paper was do a, a Reddit Ask Me Anything, or AMA, um, which is a set amount of time on the website Reddit where you make yourself available to answer questions in real time um, that people post. And it's published in the uh, new Reddit Journal of Science, which everyone should be publishing in because it has um, incredible reach. So during the two hours that we were answering questions at a, um, at a pub in Woods Hole, we had uh, 76,000 page views. Uh, about 34 of those were unique page views. Um, 34,000 people is definitely more than the number of glaciologists on the planet, and it's um, <laughs> perhaps more than the amount of uh, geodesists on the planet as well. And this was, this was fun. So um, well, first, we uh, communicated that we we're doing this thing over Twitter. Um, Twitter is also a platform that I really like for, for visuals and engaging and um, answering questions and, and back and forth. And then we, we just sat for a couple hours and asked questions. So here's kind of some of the examples of stuff we got. So this is from uh, Joe Badaya who actually, you can get, he's, it says that Joe Badaya is a professor of biology, so you, so you can get really a wide range of, of people on these forums. Uh, Joe Badaya says, welcome to the only place on earth colder than the poles, the internet. <laughs> JK, thanks for stopping by. Um, and then Joe Badaya asks a question of, you know, ice at this scale is kind of hard to grasp, is ice different? Um, in a glacier than it is in the ice, ice cubes of your freezer. And we're like, yes, um, it's way different. It's brittle, but then also uh, really viscous, a viscous fluid at depth. And we go on and have a whole conversation about kind of viscoelastic materials. Another one I pulled um, is uh, this next question by Bodark43. I've read that Greenland is actually pushed down by the thick ice pack on top. Has anyone noticed? Um, if it is now actually rising because of the melting ice. And you can say, yeah, great question, and, and yes. And then you can link them directly to the GNET or PolNet website. Um, and it's a place for, for someone to find out more information. And then the final one I'll show um, is entry-level GIS analysis, interested in, in kind of the, the hardware and software. So we talk a little bit about that. And then... Um, slowly slipping down at the bottom, who's a professor of geophysicists who may be in the audience, asked a uh, related technical question, did you use choke ring or Zephyr antennas? Uh, do you have a preference? <laughs> and then um, my advisor, Sarah, just said Zephyr because they came in the box, which is also an example of, um, you know, Kristen may allude to this next, but glaciologists using uh, geodetic tools um, we love the resolution, but sometimes we don't understand fully what goes into uh, making that great product. But anyways, it's also an example of, of the level of, of question you might get. Anything from what's it like on the ice sheet to what's the specific thing that you're using. OK, my emojis have, have gone away. But so next up, it's not all answering fun questions on the internet, um, but some, sometimes it is irksome. And I'm not going to talk about any specific ev uh, personal events for myself, but generally what I have um, perceived from talking with, with other scientists is people are really concerned about misrepresentation of themselves and their work in written audio and visual media. And this is a big stressor and prevents people from getting out and talking to people about their science. Questions are like, what if our science gets simplified to the point of being misleading or incorrect? How do I communicate something that's really gritty, you know, 10,000s of word JGR article? How do I communicate that? Um, what if I end up in real time in some sort of hostile environment and then that is, you know, strewn across the internet? These are all like real fears and they're fears that I have um, not every time I get on Twitter, but like they're going away the more I do the science communication. And I think even though these fears exist, there are resources and ways that you can 
approach science communication that will lessen uh, the probability of you running into these problems. So some of the resources uh, for getting started or for avoiding irksome parts of science communication are one, taking the reins and, and putting communication into your own hands, using things um, like, like Twitter that allow you to talk directly to the public. I like Twitter and there's this great uh, infographic um, from Darling et al. 2013, and it's the role of Twitter in science publication communication. Um, people, I think scientists think of, of Twitter, scientists who are not on Twitter, think of Twitter as a way to just um, stream of consciousness, talk about your thoughts, maybe it's for celebrities or, or CEOs. For scientists who are on Twitter, uh, we realize that it's an incredible networking tool and really is allows you to amplify uh, the science that you're doing and the science that others are doing. So um, this bubble here says the medium Twitter following is 730 times larger than the median university department size. So that means the number of people following me on Twitter is incredibly larger than the amount of people I would interact with on a day-to-day -day basis in my department at Lamont. Um, there's some other stats here, but essentially I just wanna say there are resources for getting started. There are uh, media training for scientists, which I highly recommend. How do you talk on radio? How do you talk um, on video? How do you communicate with a Washington Post uh, writer who's typing up um, the story over the phone? There's science communication workshops, and increasingly these workshops are tagged on to the day before, day after um, conferences. I went to the one yesterday run by Beth Bartel of UNAVCO, um, and so she has a wealth of information, and essentially there's, there's no reason not to go to one of these or to use these sort of in-house media experts that are now among our scientific community. And then I would say another resource for getting started is just um, start with informal opportunities. Um, at a barbecue or a hike, start with family and friends. Uh, just start disseminating information in, in your public social media as you use it. And then, yeah, so, so kind of to get over the fact that communication, communicating science is sometimes irksome, I like to remember that communicating science is essential for the planet. Um, so the fact that the very minute details I told you about superglacial lake drainages won't be translated into a Washington Post article, I think is trumped by the fact that over half the amount of sea level rise is coming from the melting of ice. That is the main message I want to get to the public, not the fact that tensile stress transients cause hydrofractures to open. Some of the public is interested in that, but a lot more of the public is interested in who's working on the problem, how big is the problem, and what can we do to fix it? Additionally, I, um, I was uh, passed a paper yesterday in the science communicating workshop by Messing and Westwood in 2014. And this was a uh, paper published in a communications journal. And they found that social endorsements fundamentally alter the way news is consumed and shared on the internet. Essentially, we're in a new media landscape where what you post on Facebook, um, your uncle may see that, and that will now be a source of your uncle's news, as opposed to uh, reading the New York Times or watching CNN. So, and through this um, kind of change in the way media is consumed and news is consumed, um, there has been, uh, we've shown that passive exposure to news or science through social media like Facebook or Twitter can change public perceptions and behavior. So it's essentially this like repeated uh, posting um, that I do of the fact that the Greenland ice sheet is melting may convince my uncle that climate change is real. And that has taken, you know, years, but it's, it's um, starting to, to steamroll. Okay, and then the final slide is that I think communicating science is essential for the planet. It's also essential for welcoming the next generation of scientists. So the other thing I love about Twitter is it allows you to talk to anyone in the world who has internet, and it is a great platform for both humanizing science and um, showcasing and highlighting and amplifying underrepresented minorities in science. So these can be uh, women in science. This is a picture of, of Sarah Rosengard, who, um, and it's posted by ComSciCom, which is a communicating science workshop for graduate students. Um, it can be underrepresented uh, minorities who post pictures of themselves. This is a hashtag scientist who selfie, which is just a hashtag just to show people what scientists look like, to change um, uh, 
society's ideas of, of what a typical science can look like, the vast range of, of people that are in science. Uh, this is a post um, on Queer STEM, so about uh, Ben Bars, who uh, unfortunately recently passed away, but was someone who I didn't know about, but essentially a transgender scientist who made a huge contributions um, to changing people's minds in neuroscience. And then finally, this is kind of a funny one. This is what a scientist looks like. Um, it's by Mariam Zaring Hallam, who I think is also a neuroscientist. And I think her post, she says, there's a ton of pressure to squash parts of yourself, of yourself to be taken seriously. Being my full self has only made my science and advocacy better. So it's another scientist who's selfie, you know, putting a bit of your um, personality into science to change how scientists are viewed to the public. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna finish up. So we started with science of uh, superglacial lake drainages, then we talked to commun about communicating science. I would say for communicating science, um, for me, it helps if I have, I'm holding the reins of, of how my science is disseminated. So I like to do a lot of things personally. And I would say a good place to start is just with family and friends, um, your own social media page, or just um, at conversations on the dinner table before expanding to wider audiences. And then uh, take advantage of science communication workshops and resources. Um, they have a lot of expertise on best practices and can help you um, navigate or prevent yourself from getting into some easy SciComm pitfalls. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for this great talk. We have, once again, some time for questions. Um, yes, so you set up a Reddit, I, I uh, am not, I don't have a Reddit account, nor do I post or read Reddit, but you um, set up a Reddit AMA by going to the Reddit AMA science page and just, there's a Google calendar of, um, of who has these time slots and you can just sign up there. So, and then uh, within a couple hours, someone who works at Reddit will email you and set you up with someone who is uh, a Reddit user and verified that works in your field or in science who will um, in real time um, monitor the discussion. So any sort of off the wall or um, just inappropriate comments were deleted before we even saw them, which was also great. Yeah, so just go to the science part of Reddit and check and see when the calendar, when there's a space for an opening. Yeah, it's not just for Jeff Bezos. I have a science question. <laughs> so um, you, are, uh, you showed that there were other lakes around your uh, GPS network. Have you looked at whether these lakes were having the same behavior at the same time or different time and what's the impact on the GPS station? Yeah. So I'll just bring up the map because there was one lake within the array that drained um, Oops, sorry. A couple days after North Lake drained in 2013. Okay, so there are other lakes in the array, and this one to the north mm -hmm. has not drained during the deployment. Um, we put the stations around that lake because we thought perhaps it would drain. This tiny lake here um, actually got a bit bigger, maybe kind of that size and drained two days after the 2013 drainage. We attempted to create a network inversion filter for both lakes, but were unable to constrain um, opening from that. We can see it in the GPS station. Essentially, we can see it in NL08. NL08 first moves um, away from North Lake and then rebounds. And then when the second lake goes, it moves um, kind of the same pattern, but just reverse, moves north and then south. They are very different timings, so you can constrain both. Like yeah, they're about two days, two days apart. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it is definitely. Um, and then we also did kind of um, just checks with MODIS imagery to make sure other major events yeah, weren't happening. Yeah, but it's um, there are thousands of lakes, and the the summer season is about ninety days long. So you definitely have lakes that are um, are draining pretty close to one another. 
a question here. Uh, as the network uh, real time, can you can you use that one? If real time, can you use that one for early warning? I hope so. So at, at th these uh, stations were out in 2011, 2014, and we um, they required, I guess, so much power that we didn't even have state of health telemetry on these stations. Um, I think it would be awesome if we could do some real time uh, GPS data here, especially for um, the specific purpose of um, perhaps mapping the lake drainage from the air as it occurs. So if you had, say, a drone or something ready to go um, on, on the ground, you could tell that drone to you know, start up and, and be flying when the lake drainage occurs. We actually don't have good, uh, I don't think anyone has good aerial footage of one of these lakes actually draining. I think we could learn a lot from, from visuals of, of being in the air from maybe, yeah, from a real time early warning. Oh, yeah. It's a great talk. I have a science communication question for you. Um, so obviously, if you're talking to someone in-house, it's easy to make sure that um, things get represented the way that you want. In our field, we often get contacted by reporters just looking for a comment. Do you have any suggestions or strategies or guidelines to deciding who you talk to um, and to make sure that you get adequately represented? Sure. So I haven't had much experience being asked to get uh, for a comment yet. The, mm, I guess the one experience I had was someone referred a reporter to me, and it was an older um, scientist. So I took that as a as a mark of a of a good journalist. Um, I would say the it's tough because the journalism timescale is very short, as you know. So if you can perhaps look up other articles that they've written and or give a quick call to other people that they've interviewed um, to see you know, what, how, how their science has been or their sound bite has been used in the past, that would be good. Um, another thing would be to, um, you can, when the journalist calls you, you can ask at the beginning of the conversation, what is this piece about? What are you intending to use my quote for? Um, and I don't know, it's, it's tough to do this in real time but you can maybe try to get a sense of before you start answering the journalist's questions of what their aims are. Um, yeah. 